Was it a dream? By Guy de Maupassant. I had loved her madly. Why does one love? Why does one love? How queer it is to see only one being in the world, to have only one thought in one's mind, only one desire in the heart, and only one name on the lips, a name which comes up continually, which rises like the water in a spring from the depths of the soul, which rises to the lips, and which one repeats over and over again, which one whispers ceaselessly everywhere like a prayer. I am going to tell you our story, for love only has one, which is always the same. I met her, and I loved her. That is all. And for a whole year I have lived on her tenderness, on her caresses, in her arms, in her dresses, on her words, so completely wrapped up, bound, imprisoned in everything which came from her, that I no longer know whether it was day or night. If I was dead or alive, on this old earth of ours, or elsewhere. And then she died. How? I do not know. I no longer know. But one evening she came home wet, for it was raining heavily. And the next day she coughed, and she coughed for about a week, and took to her bed. What happened, I do not remember now. But doctors came wrote, and went away. Medicines were brought, and some women made her drink them. Her hands were hot, her forehead was burning, and her eyes bright and sad. When I spoke to her, she answered me, but I do not remember what we said. I have forgotten everything, everything, everything. She died, and I very well remember her slight, feeble sigh. The nurse said, Ah! And I understood, I understood. I knew nothing more, nothing. I saw a priest who said, Your mistress, and it seemed to me as if he were insulting her. As she was dead, nobody had the right to know that any longer, and I turned him out. Another came, who was very kind and tender, and I shed tears when he spoke to me about her. They consulted me about the funeral, but I do not remember anything that they said though I recollected the coffin and the sound of the hammer when they nailed her down in it. Oh, God, God! She was buried, buried, she, in that hole. Some people came, female friends. I made my escape and ran away. I ran, and then I walked through the streets and went home, and the next day I started on a journey. Yesterday I returned to Paris, and when I saw my room again, our room, our bed, our furniture, everything that remains of the life of a human being after death. I was seized by such a violent attack of fresh grief that I was very near opening the window and throwing myself out into the street. As I could not remain any longer among these things, between these walls which had enclosed and sheltered her, and which retained a thousand atoms of her, of her skin and of her breath, in their imperceptible crevices. I took up my hat to make my escape, and just as I reached the door, I passed the large glass in the hall, which she had put there, so that she might be able to look at herself every day, from head to foot as she went out, to see if her toilet looked well, and was correct and pretty, from her little boots to her bonnet. And I stopped short in front of that looking-glass, in which she had so often been reflected, so often so often, that it must have retained her reflection. I was standing there, trembling, with my eyes fixed on the glass, on that flat, profound, empty glass, which had contained her entirely, and had possessed her as much as I had, as my passionate looks had. I felt as if I loved that glass. I touched it. It was cold. Oh, the recollection. Sorrowful mirror, burning mirror, horrible mirror, which makes us suffer such torments. Happy are the men whose hearts forget everything that it has contained, everything that has passed before it, everything that has looked at itself in it, that has been reflected in its affection, in its love. 
how I suffer. I went on without knowing it, without wishing it. I went towards the cemetery. I found her simple grave, a white marble cross with these few words. She loved, was loved, and died. She is there, below, decayed, a horrible. I sobbed with my forehead on the ground, and I stopped there for a long time, a long time. Then I saw that it was getting dark, and a strange, a mad wish, the wish of a despairing lover, seized me. I wished to pass the night, the last night, in weeping on her grave. But I should be seen and driven out. How was I to manage? I was cunning, and got up and began to roam about in that city of the dead. I walked and walked. How small this city is, in comparison with the other, the city in which we live. And yet, how much more numerous the dead are than the living. We want high houses, wide streets, and much room for the four generations who see the daylight at the same time, drink water from the spring, and wine from the vines, and eat the bread from the plains. And for all the generations of the dead, for all that ladder of humanity that has descended down to us, there is scarcely anything afield, scarcely anything. The earth takes them back, oblivion effaces them, adieu. At the end of the abandoned cemetery, I suddenly perceived that the one where those who had been dead a long time finish mingling with the soil, where the crosses themselves decay, where the last comers will be put tomorrow. It is full of untended roses, of strong and dark cypress trees, a sad and beautiful garden, nourished on human flesh. I was alone, perfectly alone, and so I crouched in a green tree, and hid myself there completely among the thick and somber branches, and I waited, clinging to the stem, like a shipwrecked man does to a plank. When it was quite dark, I left my refuge and began to walk softly, slowly, inaudibly, through that ground full of dead people, and I wandered about for a long time, but could not find her again. I went on with extended arms, knocking against the tombs with my hands, my feet, my knees, my chest, even with my head, without being able to find her. I touched and felt about like a blind man groping his way. I felt the stones, the crosses, the iron railings, the metal wreaths, and the wreaths of faded flowers. I read the names with my fingers by passing them over the letters. What a night! What a night! I could not find her again! There was no moon! What a night! I am frightened, horribly frightened, in these narrow paths between two rows of graves. Graves! 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 Nothing but graves! On my right, on my left, in front of me, around me, everywhere there were graves. I sat down on one of them, for I could not walk any longer. My knees were so weak, I could hear my heart beat. And I could hear something else as well. What? A confused, nameless noise. Was the noise in my head in the impenetrable night? or beneath the mysterious earth, the earth sown with human corpses. I looked all around me, but I cannot say for how long I remained there. I was paralyzed with terror, drunk with fright, ready to shout out, ready to die. Suddenly, it seemed to me as if the slab of marble on which I was sitting was moving. Certainly, it was moving as if it were being raised. With a bound, I sprang onto the neighboring tomb, and I saw, yes, I saw distinctly, the stone which I had just quitted rise upright, and the dead person appeared, a naked skeleton, which was pushing the stone back with its bent back. I saw it quite clearly, although the night was so dark. On the cross I could read, Here lies Jacques Olivant, who died at the age of fifty-one. He loved his family, was kind and honorable, and died in the grace of the Lord. The dead man also read what was inscribed on his tombstone. Then he picked up a stone off the path, a little pointed stone, and began to scrape the letters carefully. 
he slowly effaced them altogether, and with the hollows of his eyes he looked at the places where they had been engraved, and with the tip of the bone that had been his forefinger. He wrote in luminous letters, like those lines which one traces on walls with the tip of a lucifer match. Here reposes Jacques Ollivant, who died at the age of fifty-one. He hastened his father's death by his unkindness, as he wished to inherit his fortune. He tortured his wife, tormented his children, deceived his neighbors, robbed everyone he could, and died wretched. When he had finished writing, the dead man stood motionless, looking at his work, and on turning round, I saw that all the graves were open, that all the dead bodies had emerged from them, and that all had effaced the lies inscribed on the gravestones by their relations, and had substituted the truth instead, and I saw that all had been tormentors of their neighbors, malicious, dishonest, hypocrites, liars, rogues, calumniators, envious, that they had stolen deceived, performed every disgraceful, every abominable action. These good fathers, these faithful wives, these devoted sons, these chaste daughters, these honest tradesmen, these men and women who were called irreproachable, and they were called irreproachable, and they were all writing at the same time, on the threshold of their eternal abode, the truth, the terrible and the holy truth, which everybody is ignorant of or pretends to be ignorant of, while the others are alive. I thought that she also must have written something on her tombstone, and now, running without any fear among the half-open coffins, among the corpses and skeletons, I went towards her, sure that I should find her immediately. I recognized her at once, without seeing her face, which was covered by the winding-sheet, and on the marble cross, where shortly before I had read, she loved, was loved, and die, I now saw, having gone out one day, in order to deceive her lover, she caught cold in the rain and died. It appears that they found me at daybreak, lying on the grave, unconscious. <laughs>